Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is June 8th, 2022. And this video is called, What is the Oil of the Five Wise Virgins? Let's begin by praying. Father, I pray that you will open up my mouth today to utter the truth concerning this and that you will lead me to the scriptures that you want me to go to and that you will open the minds of those that you would have hear this message for the time is late and your people need to be filled with oil. In Jesus name I pray, amen. If you don't have it, you should get this book, The Law of the Offerings by Andrew Jukes. I'm going to begin today by reading uh, just a little bit from the very first chapter where he introduces the whole concept of types. Uh, the idea of type and anti-type is one that you absolutely have to understand in order to begin to grasp what the significance of the oil is in the five wise virgins. The types are a set of pictures or emblems directly from the hand of God by which he would teach his children things otherwise all but incomprehensible. In the types, God takes his son to pieces. By them, he brings within the range of our capacity definite views of the details of Christ's work, which perhaps before these pictures we should never fully apprehend. The realities which the types represent are in themselves truths and facts, very elevated, facts which have taken place before God himself, facts in which he has himself been the actor. These vast and infinite objects he brings close before us in emblems and presents them to our eyes in a series of pictures with the accuracy of one who views these things as they are seen and understood by himself, by God himself, and in a way in which they may be seen and understood by us. Now this is critical here, this next thing. I want you to pay attention. The real secret of the neglect of the types is that they require more spiritual intelligence than many Christians can bring to them. To apprehend them requires a certain measure of spiritual capacity and habitual exercise in, things of, in the things of God. In other words, to apprehend a type requires spiritual capacity and habitual exercise in the things of God, which all people do not possess because they do not abide in fellowship with Jesus. The mere superficial glance upon the word in these parts brings no corresponding idea to the mind of the reader. The types are indeed pictures, but to understand the picture it is necessary we should know something of the reality. The most perfect representation of a steam engine, and I'll pass this because you can, you can read it on your own. <clears throat> I'm going to pass through that, and I want to get to uh, He who knows much of the reality of something will surely also know something of the type. The real secret of our difficulty is that we know so little. And what is worse, we, we do not know our own ignorance. And the natural pride of our hearts, which does not like to confess our ignorance or to go through the deep searchings of soul, which attend learning and abiding in God's presence, excuses itself under the plea that these things are not important, or at least non-essential. <clears throat> you will find very little teaching about types in the church, if any at all. I was even warned against them 
back in around 1997 as the Lord began to open up the whole idea of types to me. And that was, that was a full 20 years after I had been reading the Bible daily. I did not really understand types 20 years later. Paul had to meet the same spirit in several of the early churches. Thus, in his epistle to the Hebrews, when about to prove from a type the doctrine of Christ's everlasting priesthood, he speaks of him as, quote, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, close quote. He cannot go on with the proof without telling the Hebrews how much of the difficulty of the subject was to be traced, not so much to its own abstruseness as to their own spiritual childhood and ignorance. Quoting from the scripture, of whom, says he, speaking of Melchizedek, I have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you. What are the first principles of the oracles of God? And you are become as such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. <clears throat> this is Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. It was their infancy in Christ, their lack of growth, which hindered their understanding of the scriptures. As in the natural world, life and intelligence are different. Just so is it in the spiritual. A man may be born of God, and as such, having the life of Christ... Be an heir of heaven, sure of all that the love of God is laid up in store for the redeemed family in glory, and yet like a child know nothing of his inheritance, nothing of his father's will. Be a stranger to service and warfare and ready to be deceived by any, by any doctrine. This is, I fear, the case with many believers now. The low standard of truth in the church Making the possession of eternal life the end instead of the beginning of the Christian's course has led many to think that if they have or can at least obtain this life, it is enough. This is amazing. He wrote this over 130 years ago. And yet the church is still the same thing. You just, you learn how to be born again week after week after week and you never go beyond that. Now, when Jesus, when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he said, unless you are born of the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom. I mean, yeah, if, unless you are born of the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So what Jukes is saying here is that there are people who have received the earnest of the Spirit and they can see the kingdom. But see, Jesus doesn't end there. He goes on and he says, unless you are born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. What Jukes is talking about is entering into the kingdom of God. And this is what people just don't understand. Uh, they think that they've got it made because they can say, I've been born again. I've, I've received the earnest of the Holy Spirit. Birth, spiritual birth, is birth of God forever, a life once given, never to be destroyed. Schooling, training, adorning, clothing, follow the possession of life and even the knowledge of it. And I understand that while a Christian is a babe, he needs milk and ought never to be pressed to service. At such a time, he does not need the deeper truths of Scripture. Strong meat may choke the babe as much as poison. But milk, the simpler doctrines of the word, will not support the man in active service. The man of God needs deeper truth, and it is, I believe, the lack of this deeper truth in the church, which so effectually leaves us without power or service, and brings it to pass that much of what is done is performed in the energy of the flesh rather than in the power of the spirit. Hebrews 5.14 says, Strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. It is by reason of use, that is, by using the truth we already possess, that the senses are exercised to advance further. Let us act up faithfully to the light we have, 
use out fully the grace already given, then surely our spiritual strength will not only rapidly but wonderfully increase. He goes on to explain more about what types are, but I, I'm not going to take the time to do that. I want you to understand that what I'm going to be speaking about today, you have to understand the idea of type or you just simply won't get it. So um, if you're confused, take some time to study types. What I like to say is that Typically, you have a type, you have some historical event in the Old Testament that has a prophetic fulfillment in the New Testament. For example, um, at the Exodus with Moses, the first Passover, all of the Israelites had to slaughter a lamb and put the blood of that lamb over their doorpost, the lintel on their doorposts, so that the angel of death would pass over them. That's the type, that's the historical reality. The anti-type or the prophetic fulfillment of that type was Jesus Christ dying as the Lamb of God for the sins of the, of the world so that the death angel would pass over me and pass over you. That's what the actual slaughter of those lambs at the time of Moses means spiritually and means in reality. So what Jesus did is called the anti-type or the prophetic fulfillment of the historical type. So it's important for you to understand that. Now John chapter 3 Verses 1 through 15, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And I'll, I'll just read this here because it's, it's profound. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Well, Jesus is not going to be flattered. He says to him, truly, truly. Now that word truly, truly is amen, amen. And this happens in 12 different places in the book of John. This is the second time in the book already where Jesus will put together those words, amen, amen. And it means literally truly, truly, in truth, in truth, I say to you. Now Jesus Christ is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So when he said True, truly, truly, truly. He's saying, grab hold of this. I'm telling you something that is true. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly. Listen to me. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Are you the teacher of the church, pastor, and you do not understand these things? Keep listening. Truly, truly, I say to you, he does it again. We speak what we know and bear witness of what we have seen. So Jesus is testifying concerning himself, and he knows what he's talking about. But you do not receive our testimony. Now, who is us? Who's he talking about? He's speaking in the plural. He's speaking of the Kodeshim. He's speaking of people that he has fully filled with his word who will speak the same things as he spoke himself. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, 
How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Me. He didn't tell Nicodemus that then, but that's what it means. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now he's talking about he's going to have to be crucified that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. See, that's the purpose of Jesus. Never a ministry of condemnation. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This is because Jesus' words will judge you. So if you have not received him, you are condemned already because those words will judge you on the last day. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Judge yourself, you know. Um, <clears throat> do you do wicked things? Then you probably hate the light and you don't want your deeds to be exposed. The first step in coming to the light is to repent of your sins and ask God for grace and strength to stop sinning. We all start as gross sinners. That's just the way it is. You know, and, and by the grace of God, we put off sins, but yet we still retain our mortality and we still have the ability to sin even as we get old. Well, let's... Now go to the parable, Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be lost. Now, bear in mind, Matthew 25 comes in the Bible exactly after Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is when Jesus tells all of the signs of the end times. And I have expounded on that at length in quite a few videos. I've even spoken somewhat on Matthew 25, but I have further revelation to bring to you today, and it's important revelation. Given the time that we live in, you need to pay attention. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now there's ten virgins. That, that represents that they have received the Holy Spirit and five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now often in the scripture, we are called a vessel and we have to learn how to control our own vessel subdue our own vessel so that we do not walk in sin. These wise took oil in their vessels along with their lamps, along with their witness. So Christians have a witness and they talk about how they've been saved, Jesus loves them and so on. But do you have oil? And what is that oil? While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there not be enough for us and you. But you go instead to those that sell oil and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open us. 
So they evidently got some oil. But he answered and said, Verily, I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. Who's the seller? Where do you go to buy this oil? Can you remember any places in Scripture where we are told to buy? Let's look at... Um, Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently, diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food, Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Now, who's speaking here? Well, of course, it's Jesus. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come to the waters? Isn't that interesting? Do you remember um, John chapter 4? Let's take a look at that. John 4, verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to Jacob's well, where Jesus was sitting there. In verse 6, we see, Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. That means the water from the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And now, think back to Isaiah. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Isaiah 55. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Buy but with no money. How do you buy? Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. John chapter 1 begins with the revelation of who Jesus is. He's the Word, right? The Word. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, verse 25, oh, it's, it's Ephesians 5, 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. The washing of water with the word. Now, going back to Isaiah 55, I want you to carefully look at this. Come, everyone who thirsts, come 
to the waters. Come by and eat. Okay, so you buy water. You eat water. And then the very next phrase, he says, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. So now we have, we have waters, we have wine, we have milk. And then verse 2, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Well, suddenly water has turned into bread. So we have bread. And in uh, John chapter 6, Jesus says that he's the bread of life. And that's the chapter where he says, you must eat my body and drink my blood in order to have life in yourself. And then uh, further on in verse 2, he says, eat what is good and delight yourself in the rich food. So here's all the words we have of things you are to buy. Waters, wine, milk, bread, rich food, at least five different things there. And it's all related to the waters. And now this is why you have to think in terms of type and anti-type. The Lord began to give me this word last night as I just as I lay down in bed that he brought to my mind John chapter 3 and um, and when he did suddenly I began to think of scriptures that dealt with this idea of the water of life. Now I'm going to give you all the scriptures I've written down now and I don't plan to read all these today, but you should write all these down. So we're talking about Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verses 1 and following. But then you want to write these down. John 4, verses 10 to 14, and verses 32 to 34. So here we see that Christ's food is like his water. Then John 6, verses 26 to 59, that's dealing with eating his flesh and drinking his blood, which of course are spiritual things. The words that I speak are spirit and they are life. Then John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, John chapter 13, verses 1 to 15. Revelation 21, verse 6. Just pause the video and write these down. Revelation 22, verses 1 and 17. Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 5. Hebrews 13, verses 8 through 15. And we need to look at that one. Um, so I'll go back. We'll look at that. Uh, Matthew 5, verse 6. Isaiah 44, verse 3. Proverbs 9, 1 through 6. Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. The parables. Parable of the virgins. Okay, now let's... Uh, Hebrews 13, 8 through 15. Hebrews 13. Very profound lesson in Hebrews 13. Verse 8 Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. Okay? Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. Not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Here, the writer of Hebrews is saying that these diverse and strange teachings are foods. 
You've heard it before, you are what you eat. What do you eat? What do you fill yourself with? What do you watch? What do you listen to? What do you speak? Whose doctrine do you listen to? How do you know that that doctrine is true? Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. Okay, now that he's talking about the tent still in existence, the Old Testament. We have an altar that we can eat from. What's our altar? The altar where Jesus was crucified, sacrificed for us, his body, his blood. That's the altar where we eat. Remember, in the Old Testament sacrifices in the book of Leviticus, some of those offerings, like the grain offering, could be eaten by the offerer and by the priest. Some, like the burnt offering, was not eaten because that represents the total sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. But the second one, the grain offering, we're dealing with Jesus' sacrifice that leads to our man-to-man -man relationship, our fellowship with one another. In the first of those sacrifices, in Leviticus chapter 1, and this is in this book, it's well worth reading. With the burnt offering, parts of the burnt offering were washed in water. That represents the washing of the water of the word. Then, in the second offering, which is the grain offering, those offerings are offered with oil poured upon them. Not water, but oil. Isn't that interesting? So, remember that. Oil. Now, what does the oil represent? Well, Jukes teaches, and I agree with him in this book, Jukes teaches that that oil represents the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus came and began his ministry of man to man, he was a man coming to men. When he began that ministry, he was baptized by John. The Holy Spirit fell upon him and looked like a dove. And so that was the oil being poured, the anointing being poured upon Jesus to begin his ministry. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. The important thing from this verse is to see that you have good food and bad food. Bad food will... Bad food is diverse and strange teachings. Good food is the Word of God. Now we're going to go to uh, John chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. Why did this say, why was it important to write on the third day? Because that's the day of resurrection. That's the day we are entering right now. All of scripture is a parable, which means it tells a prophetic truth. It is historically accurate, but yet it portrays prophetic reality, prophetic truth. 
So on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants, To the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification. Each held two or three measures, which came to, to about 10 gallons, each one of those. Two or three measures in each of these six jars, six stone water jars. Now, why six? Because six is the number of man created on the sixth day. 666 is the number of man because man is a beast until he has his beast nature changed by the water of the word. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding two or three measures. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, which had now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. What does this represent? Man, Jesus, can you believe Jesus? They're already drunk. They, they're, you know, when everyone has drunk freely, that's when you bring out the poor wine. The master said, but Jesus makes, he makes six times 20 at the minimum, 120 gallons of wine or 180 gallons at the most. So he makes a ton of wine. Isn't Jesus guilty of getting people drunk? What does Ephesians 5 say? Ephesians 5, 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery but be filled with the Spirit. Well, didn't Jesus just do something that led to debauchery? Of course not. We don't understand the types. We don't understand what the words mean. Jesus turned the water to wine. Now that has a prophetic reality in itself, which is, just quickly, we who have filled ourselves with water will be glorified. And that glorification is the turning of the water into wine. But there's much more here than that. Because he really did make wine and they really did drink wine and they were already drunk so they just got drunker and had a good time at this wedding. What's that do to your theology? And then, so now go to Ephesians, and let's look at Ephesians in detail. We're going to not just jump to 518. We're going to go ahead and start at the beginning. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. How do we imitate God? How, we have to know what he's like, right? We have to wash ourselves with the water of the word to know what he's like. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which is out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. How many of you still tell filthy jokes or still listen to filthy jokes? Watch movies. 
For, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time, you yourselves were darkness. <clears throat> but now you are light in the Lord. <clears throat> Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Then he talks about wives submitting to their husbands. And then we're back at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. <clears throat> wow. The two shall become one flesh. And I'm saying it, it refers to Christ and the church. Us and Christ, one flesh. Because of the washing of the water of the word. Do not get drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. <clears throat> Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. You know, the Lord gives me a new song about every 14 days. And I believe it's because I continue to fill myself with his word. Now, I, I do drink literal wine, but I don't get drunk. And this is not talking about that kind of wine anyway. What's it talking about? This kind of wine is what Hebrews 13 was talking about. This kind of food. Wine is a food. So, <clears throat> in Hebrews 13, if you remember, verse 9, Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Diverse and strange teachings are bad food. Another word for that bad food is the kind of wine that will get you drunk and lead to debauchery. It's the feeding, it's the filling yourself with false doctrine, with perverse doctrines. Oh, Glenn, show me that in Scripture. <clears throat> I'm glad you asked. Isaiah 28. Ah, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim. Ephraim represents the church. Ephraim is the type. The church is the anti-type. 
Ah, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim. Ah, the proud crown of the drunkards of the church, of the pastors of the church, and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley of those overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord has one who is mighty and strong, like a storm of hail, a destroying tempest, like a storm of mighty overflowing waters. He cast down to the earth with his hand. The proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim will be trodden underfoot. The pastors who think they know it all in the churches today will be trodden underfoot. And the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley, at the head of every every street corner will be like a first ripe fig before the summer when someone sees it he swallows it in that day the lord of hosts will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people to the kodeshim who are glorified and a spirit of justice to him to him who sits in judgment and strength to, to those who turn back the battle at the gate the battle is at our gate the battle is here. Then he j jumps back, verse 7, Isaiah 28, 7. Now he's going to go back to these drunkards of Ephraim. These also reel with wine and stagger with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. You, you think they're talk he's talking about just sitting around getting drunk, don't you? They are swallowed by wine. They stagger with strong drink. They reel in vision. They stumble in giving judgment. For all tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. <clears throat> Their teaching is as filthy vomit. And that's why no one sees where we are today because the pastors don't see it and they have never taught their people how to discern for themselves. They've never taught their people how to understand the truth for themselves, <clears throat> how to get food for themselves. They've been the ones who've handed out the food. They give the food. They're the ones who give the food and then you pay them for it. You're not qualified to get, get your own food, are you? So how do you ever learn to discern what's truth? How do you ever learn to discern what's good food and what's bad food? Glenn, surely you're making this up. No, let's keep reading. Verse 9, Isaiah 28, 9. To whom will God teach knowledge? And to whom will he explain the message? And then he answers it, to those who are weaned from the milk, to those who are taken from the breast. That's where the church is. That's where almost every Christian in the world is, still sucking the tit, still drinking the milk. That's all. <clears throat> That's all. For it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, truth upon truth. Line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. That's how I know what I know. <clears throat> because I learned a little at a time, and I added to it a little at a time. And I learned what good food was, and I continued to eat it, and I still eat it. I still continue to eat it. For by a people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, I am will speak to this people to whom he has said, This is rest, give rest to the weary, and this is repose. Yet they would not hear. They would not hear, and they will not hear even today. This message is for a few. Well, I'm sure less than 100 people will ever hear this. And the word of the Lord, the word of I am will be to them, precept upon precept. Precept upon precept, truth upon truth, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little.
And so what did we see here? That the wine that you always thought was literal wine in Ephesians chapter 5 is not. It's false doctrine. It's the doctrine, it's the false doctrine the pastors feed you. It's the same thing as the false doctrine of Isaiah 28. Now back in Ephesians chapter 5, with verse 18, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. This is the key. How are you filled with the Spirit? How can you fill yourself with the Spirit? A couple verses to consider. Isaiah 61 verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord I am is upon me because I am has anointed me. To be anointed means to be covered with oil, to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. Now this is what Jesus said when he began his ministry, remember? So the Lord anointed him. How did he anoint him? With the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit and the oil, same thing, right? The Holy Spirit and the oil. And then Acts 10.38 says this, You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So now we see that this oil the oil and the Holy Spirit, that's what the oil is talking about in the grain offering. And so the prophetic fulfillment of the oil on the sacrifice of the grain offering in Le Leviticus 2 is the Holy Spirit coming upon that sacrifice. And we are to offer ourselves a living sacrifice. So now... Look at what we have, have seen. Isaiah 55. Jesus is speaking prophetically through Isaiah and says, Come and buy from me without money and without cost. And he talks about things to buy. Water, milk, bread, rich food, wine. Buy wine. Okay? And then... Um, we need to look, uh, we need to look at Revelation chapter 3. Because there's another command to buy here. Let's look at that. The very last church, the church of the Laodiceans. To the church of Laodicea, I know your works, you're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. That's the state of the church today. That's the state of most Christians today. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and buy from me salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. How are you going to buy it? What are you going to use to buy gold? What are you going to use to buy holy white garments? What are you going to use to buy salve to anoint your eyes so that you can see? You're going to seek God. You're going to seek Jesus. You're going to seek the water of the word. You're going to begin to fill yourself with water. Wash yourselves with water. What do you think Jesus meant when he 
wash the disciples' feet, and then he said, go out and do the same to others. We do some stupid ceremony where we have people take off their shoes, and then we wash their feet, and we think we did it. No, we didn't do it. It's a picture of the washing of the water of the word. It's a picture of consuming the word of God, which is Jesus, of eating the word of God, which is Jesus. We buy from Jesus. By reading his word and praying to him that he will open our eyes, that he will give us salve. Open our eyes that we can see, open our ears that we can hear, so that we can understand your word, Lord. That's the only way. Daily, I cry out that prayer. Open my eyes that I may see. As you've heard in my recent videos, this has been a very, very difficult last six months. Um, <clears throat> and my wife, I haven't even told you about what my wife has had to go through. Or my son last Sunday with an injury that happened to him. If we were not full, of the Word of God, we could not stand. That's how hard things are. We live at the end of the age and nobody sees it. Are you a wise virgin or are you a foolish virgin? What's the oil? What's the oil? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. What does Jesus say? My words are spirit and they are life. My words are spirit. Be filled with the oil. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't get drunk on wine. Don't keep listening to false doctrine. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Word of God. Fill yourself with the Word of God. Fill yourself with the water of God. Fill yourself with the oil of God, the Holy Spirit. You get the Spirit through the water of the Word when you consume it. That's how you are filled with the Spirit, and that is your oil. That is your anointing. That is your oil. So, the end of the age is here. And the five foolish virgins come to those who are wise and say, Give us of your oil, for our lamp is going out. I can't give you my oil. You had to buy it yourself. You had to work for it yourself. It didn't cost you any money. It just took time. Time before the Lord. Time seeking his face. And here we are. The bridegroom comes. Are you ready?